It was June 7, 1981, when the eight F-16s stood ready for their mission. Each aircraft was armed with Sidewinder missiles and two massive 2,000-pound unguided bombs. This payload significantly exceeded the recommended weight limit for the aircraft frame. They began their takeoff attempt at 3.55 p.m., facing difficulties in getting off the ground due to the substantial payload. Each aircraft was equipped with external fuel tanks and weapons adding to the challenge. They succeeded just before reaching the runway's end at the airbase in Sinai. The F-15s closely trailed by the F-16s, while F-16s aligned themselves under the command of Colonel Zev Raz, guiding the formation along the shores of the Red Sea. He drew the eyes of tourists, who mistook it for an Israeli Air Force training exercise. However, the reality was, these pilots were on their way to a critical mission, the outcome of which would determine the fate of their nation. This mission stands out as one of the most daring airstrikes in modern history. It was executed with remarkable precision and goes by the name Operation Opera or Operation Babylon. This strike destroyed an incomplete Iraqi nuclear facility situated 11 miles to the southeast of Baghdad, Iraq. However, this strike posed significant challenges. The primary hurdle was the vast distance they needed to cover. The attack aircraft had to depart from the southern Israeli airbase, pass over the southern edge of Jordan, a hostile nation, and subsequently cross Saudi Arabia, another enemy, before reaching Iraqi airspace. Once within Iraqi borders, they still had to cover most of the country to reach the target site. This lengthy distance required the F-16s to be fitted with external fuel tanks, rendering the planes bulkier and less maneuverable. Deep into hostile territory, the pilots needed to fly close to the ground to avoid radar detection. They also had to communicate in Arabic and imitate foreign flight formation. Upon reaching the target, they had to execute flawless bombing runs, avoiding enemy anti-aircraft fire and interceptors, and then find a way to safely return home. In response to Iraq's reactor development, Israel began discussing strategies during Rabin's first term in office, with planning and training commencing during this period. After Begin became Prime Minister in 1977, preparations intensified, including the construction of a model reactor for pilot training. Mossad conducted clandestine operations, including alleged bombings and assassinations of individuals associated with the Iraqi nuclear program. In 1980, Saddam Hussein's invaded Iran, sparking a horrific and deadly war that stretched for eight years. Iran conducted airstrike on Iraq's nuclear facility 13 days after the start of the war. However, the raid didn't result in lasting damage. Meanwhile, Israeli government found an unlikely but important partner in this venture. Iran's Supreme Leader, Alatoya Khamenei, administration established a secret channel with Prime Minister Begin and exchanged confidential information on dismantling the facility. Iran provided reconnaissance photos to aid Israel's airstrike. In October 1980, Mossad informed the Israeli government that the damaged plant would be operational by June 1981, setting a hard deadline for the urgency of launching the strike later in that month. Just when things seemed uncertain, a stroke of luck came their way. The Iranian Air Force, in a surprising move, launched an assault on Iraqi airfields, catching Saddam Hussein's air power off guard. The Israeli cabinet saw this as a golden opportunity, a moment of destiny when they had to strike before the Iraqi Air Force could bounce back from the devastating blow. The daring raiders weren't following a straight flight path to the nuclear facility. Instead, the Israeli formation took an unconventional southern route over the Gulf of Aqaba at wave top level. By sheer coincidence, King Hussein of Jordan was vacationing aboard his yacht when Israeli aircraft overflew him. He spotted the Israeli markings on the aircraft, taking note of their direction and heavy weaponry. In a flash, he sensed the imminent danger to the Iraqi reactor. Hussein acted swiftly, instructing his government to issue a warning to Iraq. However, due to a communication failure, the Iraqi government failed to receive the message, allowing the Israeli planes to glide into Saudi airspace. In a daring move, the pilots flew in a formation resembling that of Jordan. They adopted the Jordanian accent as they communicated with Saudi air controllers. With a clever tale of being a lost Jordanian patrol, they managed to trick the Saudis. While the F-16s were flying over the Saudi Arabian desert, they had used up a lot of their fuel. So, they had to drop their empty fuel tanks to make the planes lighter. This was a risky move, as the fuel tank could have scraped one of their bombs while detaching them. Once they reached their target, the F-16s got ready to carry out the bombing mission. 
Meanwhile, the F-15s were on standby to deal with any Iraqi planes that might challenge them. After about 30 minutes, the formation crossed into Iraqi territory and descended just 30 feet above the ground to slip below the Iraqi radar. The pilots closely monitored their instruments, keeping an eye out for any signs of incoming missiles, but fortunately none appeared. When the strike group was about 50 miles away from the target, the F-15s broke away and climbed to provide air cover to the strike group. At 6.35 p.m. local time, the nuclear facility came into view on the horizon. Lieutenant Colonel Raz, leading the F-16's attack formation, directed them to ascend to 6,900 feet. They also released flares and chaff to confuse the enemy radar. The Israeli pilots switched on their video cameras and armed the Mark 84 2,000-pound bombs before plunging toward the reactor, building at a sharp 35-degree angle. The Israeli Air Force had selected these bombs for their excellent track record. At this moment, they anticipated interception, but their timing was impeccable. Just 30 minutes earlier, the Iraqi guards manning the anti-aircraft guns and surface-to-air missiles had temporarily abandoned their positions for dinner. Remarkably, the radar technicians had also, inexplicably, powered down the radar. As a result, there were no enemy fighters in the sky to challenge them, and the reactor sat vulnerable and defenseless. The lead pilot, Lieutenant Colonel Raz, released both his bombs at the reactor dome at an altitude of 3,600 feet with a 12-second delay, enabling it to penetrate the concrete shielding before detonating inside the reactor. The other F-16s follow suit, each hitting the target at precisely five-second intervals. The last pilot in the formation, Ramon, released his bombs, engaged the full afterburner, and climbed alongside the other F-16s. Although the Iraqis launched several SA-7 surface-to-air missiles, however, none managed to hit their mark. Ramon later told that Operation Opera was not more complex than their routine training missions. Ramon, the youngest member of the crew at the age of 24 during the operation, would later go on to become Israeli's first astronaut. Unfortunately, he tragically lost his life in the Columbia Space Shuttle disaster of 2003. After successfully reducing their reactor to ruins, the Israeli formation ascends to higher altitudes and begins its journey home. They opted for the shortest route back to Israel, while the Israeli Air Force scrambled their fighters to intercept any potential Iraqi MiGs. The rescue helicopters were on standby in case any pilots were downed by surface-to-air missiles. Surprisingly, there was no response from the Iraqi Air Force, and the Israeli planes returned unharmed. Prime Minister Begin proudly declared its success to the Israeli public. However, this moment of triumph was soon clouded by strict international reaction. The United Nations Security Council condemned it, while the French, arguing the targeted plant couldn't produce nuclear weapons. Some even speculated that the raid had intensified Saddam Hussein's resolve to acquire such weapons. He ordered the execution of the head of Iraqi's Western Air Defense Zone and all officers under his command above the rank of major. 